So we are back, and uh, we're a few days away from Academy Awards nominations. Mm. Um, I don't... Looking, looking a little iffy since uh, for a few people because of, you know, stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. Whatever. You know, I... I'm talking about James Franco. Yeah. The, 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 the thing on... The bomb dropped on him at, in, in, in a very precarious moment before the... The final uh, uh, date yeah. had come and gone. Yeah. You know, of course, a lot of people had already voted, but there was one or two days there where people could make a decision about what they felt about that James Franco situation. I don't think it'll affect it, but I don't know. Yeah, I, maybe not. You know, I think, then again, it's not like James Franco was going to win an Oscar for that role anyway. No. That's the weird thing, you yeah. know. Uh, a nomination, not a nomination. I don't know, whatever. But he was never going to win an Oscar for that. What I'm, what I'm curious about is to see. You know, there are films that are sort of indie hits and culty hits, and which are sometimes popular hits but not critical hits, or vice versa. There are always films that are a little bit on the bubble, and mm. you always, you know, there's usually. Um, there are always films that get nominated for director but not picture and vice versa. And those, that's what I'm curious about. I mean, we know Dunkirk's going to get a load of stuff and Shape of Water is going to get a load and Three Billboards will get a load. You know, it's, so it's, um, you know, I'm curious, will Get Out get nominated for Best Picture? Mm. Guaranteed Best Screenplay. Well, it, it, it's interesting that the Lady Birds, the Get Outs, the that, Iconias, the Lady Bird is going to be interesting. The Florida we'll, projects, we'll they get are floating. They're they, floating. They, they, they don't live in the space. I would even go so far as to say Florida Project will probably may get nominated for nothing other than supporting actor. Mm. You know, I could see Will, that. Uh, uh, um, uh, Willem. Willem for Willem Dafoe. Mm. Um, but, you know, Lady Bird, good question. I think it's guaranteed it's it's going to get nominated for picture, but will they give Greta Gerwig Best Director? Yeah, I, I see that one the other way director, around. Because director, directors nominate directors. Directors, yeah. Still an old boys club. Yeah, yeah. You know, are yeah. the are those old men going to look at that and go... And she's a first-timer, and that's a hard timer. thing to do up. Then yeah. again, on the other hand, Jordan Peele, tech, you know, first-timer. Yeah. That's a, that's a, it's a tough one but, for those you know, guys to give get, up. Get Out kind of has run the table on screenplay awards. Awards. Yeah, and it's made a ton including of Lafka. That's what we gave him. Yeah, yeah, you know, you gave it to Jordan yeah. Peele, and and so I, uh, the screenplay nomination there is is guaranteed. Uh, I think he's a long shot for director, but I think it stands at you know a, a field of ten. Mm. I think Best Picture is a good a good shot. Yeah, th that that's the one good thing about that field of ten. Yeah. Uh, is that there's a big gigantic uh, you know all kinds of little things can get in there. And, but that's pretty much well, all that happens. To the, you got the nomination. Feel I, good. I, I've done some interesting research into the uh, the field of ten, and um, and I'll, I'll I'll save that for like a future blog post or something. But it's very interesting because you know we've had a field of ten now for quite a few years, and they did it once before back in the thirties, mm -hmm. right? And um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, both times there is. Uh, there's an interesting dynamic that enters, which is that the film that tends to win the most awards is not the film that wins Best Picture. Mm. And that's a dynamic that very rarely happens, very rarely, but it happens constantly when you have 10 nominees, whether it's in the 30s or now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how to explain it, but it's interesting. Um, it might and, have something to do with the way that voting situation is is sort of broken up and might you know, be with you know committee some committee you know maybe yeah. something gravity tons of awards didn't win best picture got got the most awards uh, Mad Max got most awards didn't win, win best, best picture, picture yeah. La La Land won the most awards didn't win best picture kind of kind, yeah <laughs> kind of you know so it's, so it's, in, in all these cases it's interesting is the films that's winning the most awards not winning best picture and that's all, that's strictly a phenomenon of ten nominees. But what I find interesting about ten nominees, and I'm still not sure I'm totally sold on the idea, but is is that uh, we used to always wonder with the five nominees. Ah, I wonder what the what the next five were. Mm -hmm. Well, now we know. Now we know. Yeah, yeah. you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, and and we know that they wouldn't have had a shot in hell winning. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. So you know, it's, it's yeah. an, it, it, but it is an interesting thing. It, it makes the show more interesting, and, and what it does do. It's that second five. Yeah. Everything, everybody else that's involved in that second five, yes. uh, because that second five really doesn't have a shot at, at best picture. No. But everybody else involved in that second five uh, it, it might pluck off something, might pick off something. Very true. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you just never know what you'll see. And, and, and it makes for a more interesting show and it makes for, you know, more interesting possibilities. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to take the stage up there. But, you know, we shall see. We shall see, man. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I've got a bunch of uh, Asian-themed stuff to uh, to talk about right at the top. It's kind of accumulated, and it's worth uh, discussing. You know, Andy Lau. Mm. I love Andy Lau. I didn't yeah. used to love Andy Lau. Andy Lau back in the 80s, late 80s-ish, um, was was this really good-looking Hong Kong actor who just, he was wooden. Mm. He was just a chunk of clay. <laughs> and he, he's a good good face, and he'd give these, you know... I mean, I was in Hong Kong once when, you know, one of his concerts was being, you know, because it's obligatory when you're an actor in Hong Kong. You yeah. also have to be a pop star. Yeah. Have to be, have to, <laughs> got to do both. That's what it means to be a hyphenate. And one of his concerts was being televised, and there he is in, like, this velvet suit, and women draped around in his very, about his feet, very dramatic, you know. <laughs> but not not a great singer either. So I was never a huge Annie Lau fan. I was like, okay, so I get it. You're a pretty face, and you can sort of sing and whatever. And then, man, he turned. Mm. And it may have been Infernal Affairs. I can't remember where it was, but somehow he turned and he became a real actor. And yeah. he has just enthralled me ever since. And the crazy thing is, the guy just, he, he's got to be like 85 years old now. Yeah. I, I he, and he look, no, he's, he's, I mean, he's, 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 he's 50s. 50 something. But he, for one thing, this is one of the things that happens, I've noticed. It's it's it, 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 you, you get older. For one thing, when the looks go away, yeah. When the, when you, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. You know, and I, I know people, oh, man, no, look. Yeah, I, I remember Matthew McConaughey when he was actually good looking. Yeah. Okay, uh, so 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 he's a perfectly handsome man. But you, but but when you literally can't count on that anymore, you know, Brad Pitt. Yeah, I remember, I know all these guys when all they had to do was walk into the room and and they're good to go, whether yep. they could act or not, and some of them couldn't. Yeah, uh, but when that goes away, man, you better have some skills. Well, he's got them. Uh, we got three Andy Lau movies. Three freaking Andy Lau movies. Um, uh, Herman Yao who directed uh, Ip Man, The Legend is Born, and a lot of other great movies, uh, directs Andy Lau in Shockwave, which is just, you know, great action, and Andy Lau, just that timeless face of his. Um, and it's it's he, it's basically, uh, it's kind of like a SWAT movie, except it's not SWAT, it's the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team, right? So it's like Hurt Locker meets SWAT yeah. in, a, in a Hong Kong cop film. Yeah, That's basically what it is. And, uh, you know, he wears the suit and they got the bombs and everything is, you know, ticking uh, the hostage situation. It's just it's not a great concept for um, it, it's I shouldn't say great. It's not unique, mm. but it's fun. And yeah. Yao directs the hell out of it. And Andy's great. And you, you really you're into it. So that's uh, that comes to us from Cynodyme. That is Shockwave on Blu-ray and DVD combo. We also have The Adventurers, which is really interesting. It's uh, Andy Lau. Look at the cover here. It's basically the the the, the John Woo killer pose. Oh, I love it. I love it. The gu- but with yeah. the with the guns. But it's uh, it's Andy Lau and Jean Reno. And I thought, well, that's an that's an interesting pairing. And you know, it totally works. Jean Reno, he just brings the heavy like he always does. Uh, this is from Wellgo, and uh, it is uh, Andy Lau plays a. Uh, uh, a a a legendary thief. Shu K plays his girlfriend, and uh, they're gonna they're planning this crazy crazy heist. And uh, Jean Reno is the uh, you know is the is the the the, the 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 gutsy French cop who's chasing him around the world. It's actually it's actually really really fun. Uh, that's also a Blu-ray and DVD combo set. And then lastly is uh, Andy Lau and Donnie Yen. Uh, now Andy Lau only appears in this. It's just it's primarily a Donnie Yen movie. It's called Chasing the Dragon, and uh, Andy Lau makes just uh, a, a, an appearance, but they plaster him all over the packaging. And uh, Donnie Yen kind of kills this. Uh, it's the true story of Crippled Ho, mm. who is a 1963 era, uh, very famous Hong Kong drug uh, lord. And um, it, it's 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 quite a story. Andy Lau plays cop. Only this time he's a dirty cop. So you get you know it, it, it's a little bit like the uh, like the French film Marine, mm-hmm. which is a great gangster saga. Scarface. There's a lot of Scarface here. Has a lot of you know Tony Montana feel. And uh, I am just thrilled at what a great actor Donnie Yen has become. You know Donnie is the. It's funny he was the. The second guy in a lot of those uh, those Jet Li movies yeah. from that era, he was the other guy. You know, he occasionally <laughs> got a starring role like Iron Monkey. Uh, but back in the in the '90s, the early '90s, you know, it was looking like, well, this is Jackie Chan and Jet Li are going to be the stars, and Donnie's just going to kind of fade away with the rest of these guys. And you know what? Jet doesn't make movies anymore. 
Jackie makes movies, but he's old. Yeah. And Donnie Yen is in his prime. Yeah. And it's crazy. And he's he's the same age. It, it, he's he's still lean. He's super lean. He never he never was as physical as Jet and Jackie. You know, Jackie falling yeah. down, Jet, yeah. you know, trying yeah. to be, you know. Yeah. Donnie was contained. Yeah. Uh so he, you know, he didn't so he didn't jack himself all up as much as they did. Well, you know, and he looks the same fighting now as he looked when he was fighting when he was twenty five. Absolutely. It's amazing. Great genes. Uh I've interviewed Donnie a couple couple of times did a did a piece on him for the la times gosh must have been like 18 years ago 15 years ago but he um you know his mom is is one of the most legendary wushu instructors in history i did not know well, yeah no no i yeah. did not know that so, i did not so, know this is like a surprise so i didn't know it donnie donnie yen kind of lives in the shadow of his mom <laughs> in the world of wushu uh as a movie star but it's like oh donnie yen and then you you know you get into wushu and they're like oh Really? That's your mom? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Love your mom. Can you get your mom's autograph for me? <laughs> Can your mom teach me how to throw a punch? Yeah. But he, he, he learned from his mom. Pretty uh, great. Pretty love great. It, love it. Love so it. those are the Andy Lau movies. Uh, here's what else we got. We got Wolf Warrior 2, which is like the most successful film in the history of China. Um, they they kind of finally figured out how to make these nationalistic propaganda films not bad. Yeah. Uh, Wolf Warrior is just crazy, crazy, hyper patriotic uh, Chinese nationalistic, just badass action. Directed by Wu Jing, who's one of their top action directors right now. It is of course a sequel to the 2015 uh, Wolf Warrior, which was a hit, but not as big as this one. Uh, this thing's just been packing them in all over China. Is it uh, is it really really that good? Um, it's fine. It's not you know. I mean it's 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 a, it's a little bit crazy. The action is really over the top. Uh, it's it's basically just people with guns shooting for about two hours straight. It's just nonstop <laughs> guns and explosions is all it is. Um, but it's well done. It's very very well done, and uh, it's got Frank Grillo in it. You know, so you get a little. You got a got a guy who's something of a profile in Hollywood. Yeah, uh, people might remember him from Captain America: Civil War. Um, anyway, so Wolf Warrior Two on uh, Blu-ray and DVD combo set from Wellgo is you know perfectly fine. I, I, I again, you know, there are better Hollywood movies, but not as far as the Chinese are concerned. Uh, and then we also have God of War, which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, Vincent Zhao. Whose claim to fame is that he did, he also did a few things in the in the nineties, and he briefly replaced Jet Li in the Once Upon a Time in America series. Um, Vincent Zhao stars in this. This is just kind of straight up uh, Chinese period film. Uh, takes place in the sixteenth century, and he's a uh, you know Sammo Hung is uh, is is kind of this Sammo. this Sammo's this military. He did all the, the action choreography here. Uh, Sammo is the, uh, the this kind of big military leader. Vincent Zhao is his uh, kind of first in command, and they've got to you know go after these pirates. And um, it's uh, it, it's it, it the you know it's pretty thin in terms of story, but it's heavy on the action. Uh, and it, you know it's, it's based on a true story, directed by Gordon Chan, who's a you know a veteran. It's uh, you know it's it's in the, it's in that spot. It could be a little funnier. It could be a little more f- like enjoyable, but uh, it plays it pretty heavy, and that's okay. Uh, Gao Zhixi does uh, The Game Changer, which is out on a Blu-ray, not a combo set, just strictly a Blu-ray, which is uh, kind of a hipster gangster movie. Um, again, Chinese film, Mandarin language. Uh, middling. This is not uh, one of the top-tier films, but it's um, you know it's got some good action. It's nicely photographed. It's a gangster film. Yeah. It doesn't really reinvent the genre. Uh, Jackie Chan presents, which means he had nothing to do with it other than putting his name onto it, uh, Reset, which is a, uh, which is a, 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 a kind of a science fiction biotech thriller that really stretches credibility. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a little time travel thing and it, it doesn't, none of it makes much sense, but it's nicely shot. And, um, you know, Jackie threw his name on it. The director just goes by the name Chang. Trying to be uh, all hip and Almodovari. Um, yeah, yeah. It's called Reset. It's you know, it's 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 fairly routine, but you know, it's not great, not bad. Uh, collection two of the TV series Garo, uh, which is Japanese, and uh, this comes to us from Kraken Releasing. It is this is sort of uh, in that live action anime zone. Uh, it, it, it has very much an anime feel to it. The story, the, the world that it inhabits, the special effects, it all feels very fantastical as though this would probably be better as anime. Uh, and it might be, but 
You know, uh, there's the whole thing like, you know, Garo is, is the name they give to this special armor and it's mystical armor and yeah. the whole thing. Uh, you kind of, if you haven't seen the collection one, you're not going to know what's going on. You really need to have gotten the first collection, but as a continuing story, it's pretty good. And then, uh, on DVD, not on Blu-ray, we have a few other things. One is L-O-R-D, Legend of Ravaging Dynasties. Uh, this is a kind of straight up, uh, wuxia thing. Um, it's, uh... It's okay. It doesn't. It doesn't really make sense. The, 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 there's CGI in here that I thought was really bad, and I wish they'd kind of not do so much CGI in Hong Kong and Chinese films these days. Um, but it's, I it, 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 it's. I don't know. It yeah. the action. The action's fine. Special effects are poor. The plot is iffy. Uh, Tokyo Idols is funny. Uh, it probably doesn't, it shouldn't be funny, but this is a documentary about the, um, the pop idol phenomenon in Japan, which is so unlike anything else in the world. And, uh, it is, it's just purely a a, a unique, one of those things that just exists only in Japan. And the rest of the world just looks at them and just says, what is going on on your island? There are just certain aspects of Japanese culture that just don't travel, but the world is fascinated by them. And this is one of them. And the internet has made this even, it's just made it completely viral. Uh, so anyway, yeah. uh, director is Kyoko Miyake. And uh, it gives you a really interesting insight into the, this particular industry in Japan. And it is, in fact, an industry. It's quite interesting and, and uh, it's, it's worth taking a look at. So Tokyo Idols, really fascinating look at a, a particular un- a uniquely Japanese phenomenon. And then we get to the last two, which are both really, really terrific. Uh, this first one is a Thai film that was at uh, Toronto and Locarno and a bunch of festivals. Uh, it's a Thai film by, uh, well, it's called By the Time It Gets Dark. And the director is, oh, here I go with my Thai names again. <laughs> you know, we, we just call him Joe, right? Joe. Uh, Joe. We, we're a soul, uh, a, a, a pong, yeah. however you pronounce it. We just call him Joe. He's Uncle Uncle Boonyi. Well, th- well, this isn't that director. This That's, is, this, this is no, this, this is a different movie. director. Okay, right, this yeah. is this is Anocha, but it's almost as bad. I just want to, it's like, why don't I just call you something else like yeah, Joe? Yeah. Anocha Suicha Kornpong. Anocha Suich, Suicha Kornpong. Yeah, well, I'm, sure I'm completely destroying that. Anyway, uh, this is the the second film from Switch Corn Pong, and uh, it is a wonderful uh, tapestry of uh, interlocking stories, all set against the backdrop of the 1976 um, massacre of student demonstrators in Bangkok, and uh, it's a beautiful recreation of the period, and it's uh, it's some some really great acting here. It's a very very sharp script. Um, powerful, powerful movie, and uh, all a lot of stuff packed into just 105 minutes. It's really, really worth checking out. I'm sorry it's not on Blu-ray, uh, but it is called By the Time It Gets Dark, and uh, that is from Kim Stim, and it's really, really worth checking out. And then my favorite of the whole lot is uh, Soul on a String from Zhang Yang. This was also at Toronto, uh, and this is from Film Movement. I am a huge fan of Zhang Yang. I wish this was also on Blu-ray. But I, I guess there isn't necessarily the um, the uh, demand for it. Anyway, Zhang Yang, I've actually interviewed on a few occasions. Fascinating guy. Uh, kind of comes from the sixth generation, but he's not of the sixth generation. He's just from the same period as the sixth generation. Uh, has always been very, very independent and paved his own way. Really interesting uh, director and um, uh, fascinating guy to talk to. In any case, Soul on a String is uh, takes place... In the uh, in in you know the Himalayas in Tibet and uh, deals with a a this kind of itinerant um, he's not a holy man he's just a, he's kind of a, a mysterious wanderer we can call him a mountain man and uh, there's this kind of uh, I don't want to call it I don't want to say this is like an Indiana Jones movie because it's not but there is a mystical stone and it has to be returned to this uh, this giant Buddha. Uh, somewhere in the mountain. Anyway, it is, uh, and it becomes this. It becomes both a literal journey and a spiritual journey, and it's really, uh, it's really mystical and it's really interesting. It's got a lot of provocative ideas in it. 
and um, a lot of symbolism that's not overly uh, overly heavy, uh, which is nice. And then you get a great short film on this as well uh, from Lebanon called The Rifle, the Jackal, the Wolf, and the Boy. So uh, this is really terrific. The Soul on a String just begs for a, a high-def treatment, but nonetheless, it is, uh, it is a really interesting film from director Zhang Yang and uh, highly recommended. So... That is our collection of really cool Asian films this week. Outstanding. Outstanding. Actually, some good stuff in there uh, for stuff. folks to start digging into. Can I knock off a few of these yeah, uh, yeah, new, new, new releases? It. New releases. Well, one of them being Mark Felt. Mark Felt, played by Liam Neeson in this film, with Diane Land playing his wife. Mark Felt, of course, being uh, ultimately revealed after 30 plus years as <laughs> Deep Throat. <laughs> kind of ruins all the President's Men. Now. Yeah, you know, do you, I watch all the President's Men now and just imagine Liam Neeson in the shadows? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Uh, in 2005, I think he was 90. He was, 90, he was over 90 years old, Mark Felt, uh, when he revealed himself yeah. uh, to have been uh, Deep Throat all those years ago. This movie was supposed to be among the movies that we were talking about this year uh, during awards season. Yeah. Peter Landisman uh, directed the film. Yeah, yeah he was a. Uh, uh, a journalist, I think New York Times, maybe Washington Post journalist who did this. You know, you know, this movie, um, as a little bit of a history lesson, fine. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that I really give a damn about what was going on in the in, in, <laughs> in the bowels of Mark Felt's life. Yeah. The fact that he was who he was, and 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 why he deigned to do what he did. That's yeah. interesting, and that's in this movie. Yeah. But we get way behind the scenes of his life too. His wife, uh, played by Diane Lane, who was a bit of an alcoholic. His daughter, who was involved in the um, anti-war movement and sort of disappeared right. for a while. All, you know, relatively speaking, interesting. But, you know, yeah. just the stuff of a human life. And, and 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 I don't know. I guess that's why we're not talking about it right now. I know this. Liam Neeson is probably thinking to himself, you know what, I'm never going to play anything but that guy in Taken ever again. <laughs> because every time I try to play something else, it, it you know, it, it sort of tanks. Liam Neeson's an action film star. Yeah. Uh, he's, an action, he's, a, he's an action star at an age when you're not supposed to become an action star. Yeah. Somehow yeah. that clocking, happened for clocking, him. Clocking, if not over, 70. Yeah. Liam Neeson. Yeah. Uh, this is okay. Ext uh, special features include some extended and deleted scenes in the commentary by the director, uh, Mark Felt. Um, Chris, goodbye, Christopher Robin, which was another lovely little movie that I think we thought we might have been talking about uh, around he, about now. Well, because because these movies tend to make the Oscar round, yeah. right? If you think about uh, Finding Neverland, right? The story of, of, of Barry and Peter Pan. And of course, we and we, you know, every every time somebody does a big British biopic about the life of an author, mm -hmm. we go, "Oh, that's gonna be a sure thing." Like Iris, right? I mean, there, there's a ton of them, and we probably thought, "Oh my goodness, you know, yeah, sure, why not?" A. A. Milne and uh, and there's a little and, bit and, of something and going the on there, you know, and uh, and all you know the the cry, yeah, I I think we really thought, and it is a good story, but it just didn't. It's not that kind of. And I'm, uh, another Margot Robbie film. Margot Robbie playing. The, she was That's so good in this, problem. by the way. You know, did you and, like her in this? I thought she was okay in this. Yeah, I didn't she... like her. The his his look. His wife had some issues. Yes, AA's true. wife had yes. some issues uh, around there. And of course, he was a World War One veteran. Yes, I think your dad was a World War One yes, veteran. Yes, he was. That's so interesting. Yeah, uh, and 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 was suffering from what they didn't call post traumatic stress. Back yeah. then, yeah, uh, and the Winnie the Pooh thing was away from the work that I. Anyway, interesting commentary uh, by the director here and a few other people, and some behind the scenes stuff. And uh, you know, I, actually, I still think it's a movie that people ought to pick up and watch. I do. It, it, it is worth watching. Uh, Domhnall Gleeson is is a very very good actor, and I think he he can do better than that. But he's become really interesting. He is, of course, Brendan Gleeson's son. Yeah, and uh, he hams it up in the new Star Wars film in, in, <laughs> in a really terrible way. Um, it's not his fault, though. They made him do it. They, I know. He just hands <laughs> it up. But, you know, X, X Machina and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, so many. He's, he's been, he was in like five movies a few years ago that were all Oscar contenders. So he's really, really good. And Brendan Gleeson, by the way, you, have you seen Paddington 2? Yes. I took, so, I, I, took, so, I took my daughter yeah, to see Paddington 2. So good. Brendan Gleeson is so damn funny in that movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, this is, it's been, it's been, it, you got to see Paddington 2. Brendan Gleeson plays. The cook in prison, uh, where Paddington winds up, and uh, he's the he's the feared cook. Everyone fears him, and he's so funny. It just had me in tears. He was I was laughing so hard. This is fantastic, man. Um, happy Death Day. I got to tell you, yeah, from the producer. This is uh, yeah. those those, those Bloomhouse guys over there who do you know all that stuff. This the, the, this the get is out the, from the, the trailer made yeah. this. You know, because for yeah. one for one thing, it's effectively Scream. 
Yeah. Okay. Of course it is. For those of us who are over twelve, all right, they, you know they they made just. But movie everyone in the went 90s. to see it because of the trailer. Because of the, because it, the trailer it, freaked them out. It, it is. It is a, it's neat a clever. Concept. It's a very, it's a very clever very, trailer. Very clever thing. A young woman who has to she keeps getting killed and re- repeating the thing. It's, it's Groundhog Day meets. Scream. Yeah. It's what it is, right? Yeah. You watch Groundhog's Day, you watch Scream, yeah. you squeeze them together, you get this movie. <laughs> well, and I have to say this. It's, it, the marketing on this was superb, and it was really clever, and it was really smart. And the movie's fine. However, the better movie is The Final Girls, yeah, which is genius, but which was not picked up by a major distributor, which was not a Blumhouse movie, which didn't really have a lot of juice behind it. Kind of went into theaters for a moment, then went to DVD, and then vanished. Yeah. And yet it's a better movie. It's, it's a be- so yeah. smart. So, it is. you know, Happy Death Day, fine. Have a good time with it. But The Final Girls, definitely check that out. The, the one thing this DVD has to offer is an alternate ending. Yeah. That's always fun. Uh, the Snowman. This Michael uh, Fassbender film. Look, this didn't work for me. Um, but, you know, it, it's sort of like the nature of these things are not working for me so much. There's another serial killer film, this guy, uh, long history of these sort of yeah. serial killing things. The first, the, 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 the first big snow and they find the snowman at the car. And it's a sort of bloody thing. And he has to sort of like a um, young female detective who's coming in. She's brilliant. She's got to help him figure out who's doing this stuff. I, I thought it would be better because the guy who directed it is Thomas Alfredson. Um, directed Let the Right One In, yeah. that little vampire. Yeah. But the but that Sh- version of the of the yeah. yeah. And should have been better. It should have been so it should have been better. Should have been better. Anyway, a uh, few bonus features uh on this, but not I thought there was a director's commentary, but no, there's not. All right, anyway, whatever. It's the snowman. Got a few DVDs here. Uh kind of I don't want to say throwaway films, because they're not throwaway, but they they slide under the radar and they're worth making a mention of on a on a few important points um uh, one is a thriller called jawbone which yeah. has which has ian mcshane and ray winstone in it and that's enough for me ian mcshane and ray winstone both just bring the heavy so beautifully uh, that's that boxing movie right yeah it's a boxing movie it didn't really you know lionsgate did not do anything with this here theatrically and i'm a little bit surprised because i i thought this this could have gotten some some theater juice uh but you gotta you gotta work a little bit to promote it Anyway, uh, Johnny Mc- Johnny Harris plays Jimmy McCabe, who's a you know a, a, a prize fighter who was you know great when he was younger, and now he's kind of trying to do the Rocky thing. And um, it, it's uh, it's it's got a lot to say. It's not anything that hasn't already been said in movies like Rocky and its ten thousand sequels. But um, Ian McShay and, and Ray Winstone are just great in it, and uh, more so than Johnny Harris, and that's what makes it worth checking out. So it's probably a good rental. Yeah, uh, I, 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 you know the the so called quote unquote faith based um, genre is is making strides. I've been very they're critical. Get, of, they're they're getting better. They're getting better. You know, I've been because I'm, they figured something out. Yeah, uh, they figured out to be subtle. <laughs> well, it's you know what it, Charles and I mentioned this on the radio. Charles was the one who really uh, kind of summed it up, which is drama is about asking questions, and faith based movies tend to be about giving you answers. The answers, yes. So they're inherently not very dramatic. People go to them n- knowing and expecting that they will validate a particular point of view, which is sort of anti dramatic. So what they're doing is they're starting to actually switch their stories up a little bit. And uh, this one is called Extraordinary. It's a true story. Uh, Kirk Cameron is, is in it along with, you know, not a substantial part, but he's in it, along with uh, Leland Klassen, Sherry Rigby, Karen Abercrombie. These people will mean a little something to you if you've seen some of these movies in the past. Um, anyway, it's basically the true story of um, David Horton, uh, who's kind of a famous super marathoner. He was a college professor and a super marathoner. And uh, his marriage and how, uh, you know, he the, the, the strife that his running introduced into his marriage and some health problems and then, you know, sort of how faith leads him to, to want to make one last great race. Because um, he, he, an, an he was a runner, but it was inspirational to lots is, of people. Yes. And, and the fact— the Which reason, is all true, by the way. It's all true. Yeah. And the reason this works and transcends all of that sort of faith-based genre stuff is because it does get into, you know, issues in the marriage and the, and the acting is good. So uh, Extraordinary, I'm going to say, you know, is, a, is another step forward for, for this uh, woebegotten genre. Uh, the last one here uh, just makes me want to cry. Um, it's called A Dog and Pony Show. And it, <laughs> I know, I know. A Dog and Pony Show. Uh, this is one of those family comedies. 
and you 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 know just from the the name of it um it's really really silly it it it's it means to be heartwarming the thing that's heartbreaking about this is that it stars Mira Sorvino and Ralph Macchio um come on Tim look at that picture yeah. i mean it just that's Mira Sorvino. She's won an Academy Award, yeah. and they put her name right in the middle. You know, she Academy should, she, Award she, she, winner. She, she should slap the crap out of a Harvey Weinstein. That's just the, for that. That's where I was going to go yeah. with this, that's, uh, that's, because that's that's why. That's the problem of Harvey Weinstein right there. This that's is, what he did to Mira Sorvino. Please, people, please. Mira Sorvino deserves yeah a better career. Yeah, she got screwed by Harvey. Um, her dad rightfully threatened to kill Harvey recently, yeah, yeah. which I thought, good for you, good yeah. on you, Well, dad. he's an old Italian. You don't want to mess with Paul Sorvino. Do not mess with Ralph Paul Ralph Macchio, on the other hand, that's probably the right movie. Yeah, it's probably the right movie. <laughs> Ralph, for sure. Look, Ralph had a good run. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Why am I it, messing with Ralph? He's never done anything yeah, to Karate me. Kid and Crossroads, and <laughs> that was kind of it. He, 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 look, he, he, Ralph Macchio is like uh, 75 years old, and he still has the face of a 12-year-old. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. That's it. Anyway. Uh, Ralph Macchio's fine. He, he, he's not going to hurt. But Mira Sorvino is an amazing actress, an incredible talent. She deserves better than this. So please, people, give her some good, give her some good jobs. Make, make the evils of Harvey Weinstein right. Yeah. Please fix that problem. Shouldn't be doing it. Correct all of that show. foolishness. Um, uh, inspired by true events. It always worries me yeah. when that's above the top. Anyway, thank you for your service. Uh, from from the from the 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 well, it says from the writer of American Sniper. What it means, yeah. of course, is from the writer of the screenplay. The yes, there correct, the not the book. Yeah, yeah, because that guy's dead. Um, um, in any case, this is this is you know a well intentioned film about sure. um uh, soldiers coming back from Iran trying to reintegrate into their families, reintegrate into society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it's 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 a it's a, it's a moving movie. Uh, it's a funny thing. You and I are, of course, old enough. To have been of a, a certain age when all of the Vietnam movies and post Vietnam movies were happening, yeah. right? So those movies started in earnest. So a few of them actually uh, came at tracks and whatnot while yeah. the war was still going on. But those movies sort of started, started in earnest about 1978, uh, Deer Hunter, uh, uh, Coming Home. Uh, uh, um, you know, all of the, you, yeah. you work your way oh, right on up through the eighties. You yep. get your, you get your gardens of stones, you yeah, get your platoons, you, you get your, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. we, so there was, so each time we have one of these, uh, great wars, there will be a cache of movies that come during and not long after, even after the first Gulf war, I think we got jarhead out of the first Gulf war, you know, uh, from, from, yeah. from the early nineties. Yeah. Jarhead was about that war, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and there were a few. I don't know, man. This time around, these movies, I don't know. They, they're they not – all of those movies that I'm talking about from before were movies that resonated deeply in my life. Uh, you know, Deer Hunter is a movie that I, I was go, I was going off to – I think it was Deer Hunter. What's Deer Hunter? About 70, 78, 79? Deer Hunter 78. 78. So, yeah. so the very next year, I went off to the Air Force, to the military. And that movie was a movie that we were all thinking about and talking about and engaged in. And then, of course, all of those movies. It's not happening this time. Um, these movies do not resonate uh, either with me or, I guess, with the, you know, with the youth the way they did before. But they should. There's no reason why this movie shouldn't move me. Uh, but I don't know, dude. It, it, they just don't. They, don't. they don't move me either. Yeah. I, I, they, and... and I'm sure there's a way of doing it, but um, you know what? You, you got to pick your spots, and I, I think we, we've been it, inundated. We need to breathe a little they bit. They all like feel like propaganda in one way yeah. or the other. I had to talk about 12 Strong a yeah. week or so ago when I was yeah. on the road. And they're, and they're all propaganda in one way or the other. It's not you know, jingoistic, nationalistic yeah. propaganda or sort of lefty, uh, right. you, know, you know, socialistic propaganda some, one need, way or the other. You need some distance. You yeah. need some distance. And uh, – We'd, it's rare that you get something like, for example, best years of of our lives, which was 1946. Yeah, you know that's one year after the end of World War II, and uh, William Wyler is looking back it, with a surprising degree of uh, of reflection on it, and uh, that just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, well, it's one of those things. Um, this is kind of funny. Uh, the cook off. Uh, this is just one of these big wacky funny movies that that uh, is, is, is a takeoff on our current trend in cooking shows. Yeah, it's a big gigantic cooking contest. It's going on you have all these sort of wacky contestants uh uh engaged in a whole bunch of fuels it's funny it's silly it's nonsense silly. and uh you know these people should be in a better movie all of them but uh look melissa mccarthy 
is at the center of this movie. Yeah. This did not get a theatrical, theatrical release. release. No, it did I not. I think this. I think. I think we're done with that now. Yes, we are. Uh, 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 you know, yeah, yeah, which you know, I like her, but I'm sorry, she that, she was she, always yeah. a television personality. Always, it, she's Roseanne for her generation. Why she got to make 15 and major I, motion pictures? And I'm also, get. I I really badly want Diedrich Bader to start doing yeah. real movies again because he's just so talented and so funny, and he just never really gets that that breakthrough part. Uh, office Space, he steals Office Space with his little his little off screen thing. They're doing they're showing the breast exam again. I mean, come on, yeah, man, yeah. it's just funny stuff. Uh, 9-11 is a, uh, uh, this was, okay, so on this, this last year on the, uh, on 9-11, on the weekend of 9-11, I was on radio, and there were probably four movies that had 9-11 themes, mm. documentary, uh, you know, a little independent, there were, and the only one they did not screen for us was 9-11, which I have in my hand here, uh, the Charlie Sheen film, which is not terrible, I don't know why they didn't screen it for us, I think they were afraid with Charlie in it and, you know, whatnot. Um, it's not terrible. It's not great, but it's not terrible. It just doesn't quite play its story the way that it should. Um, but the idea is five people get trapped inside an elevator in the World Trade Center when the when the uh, uh, plane strikes mm. the building, and it's you know one of those claustrophobic lifeboat type things. It's it's exactly Hitchcock's lifeboat. It is it is lifeboat on nine eleven in an elevator. That's exactly what it is. And uh, but you know what they they play it well. Gina Gershon and Whoopi Goldberg and Luis Guzman. These are these are these are all really good actors. And uh, again, with those actors, it should be a better movie. Uh, Martin Gu- uh, Gui Gui, I think is how you pronounce it. Co-wrote it and uh, directed it. Not quite up to up to snuff here, but uh, you know, I mean, you could do worse. It's not it's not. It, if, if you're curious, you will not be entirely disappointed. And then my entire high school is sinking. My entire my entire high school sinking into the sea uh, is a strange animated uh, thing, which uh, I, I'm I'm kind of not quite. It's more it's it, it it's it's trying too hard to be a cult film. I think is maybe the uh, the best way to put it. This also did not get a theatrical release. Um, I'm not sure it necessarily deserved it. It would have been a really, really tough film to handle. You kind of got to put it uh, put it out there and let people find it. Some very, very good voice work on here. Uh, Jason Schwartzman, Susan Sarandon, Reggie Watts, Maya Rudolph, uh, and Lena Dunham. Uh, the uh, it, it, it's what was the uh, what was the uh, Charlie Kaufman thing a few years ago? Which one are we talking the about? Animated, uh, the Clay Man. Oh, the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, with uh, with it's, it's actually rotoscope thing. What was the name of that thing? No, the, with with, with the, where they swap out the heads of the. Oh. Uh, uh, where, it, no, well, never mind. Look it up. It was the, it was the Charlie Kaufman animated uh, Animalisa. Animalisa, yes. Animalisa, thank you. So uh, with, the, an- with the anime with the sex scene in it, yeah. So this is not Animalisa. This is all hand drawn. However, I I feel a similar emotional distance to this, and uh, it, because it's it's dealing it, it's dealing with too much. It's sort of trying to wrap itself philosophically around too many sort of life issues. And when you when you immerse an animated film in that stuff, mm. it, the animation seems to sort of I, I can't focus on the animation anymore. I'm I'm getting very angsty about everything else that's going on. So um, and basically, you know, it's it, it's a, it's a high school backdrop, um, but it doesn't. Uh, it just it it. it it's missing something. So anyway, my entire high school sinking into the sea. Um, very strange, but uh, beautifully animated film. A little bit too dense in its ideas. It's trying too hard to, to do too much, I think. But anyway, uh, Dash Shaw, who wrote and directed, does an audio commentary that's quite good. It also has short films by Dash Shaw. So um, it's a little bit more interesting to get to dig into the making of it and the... The, you know the, the the ideas behind it and if, you know that that's interesting i'm not going to completely uh but it's just too much for me it's too yeah. dense mm. uh i i really like this little movie uh bitch right jason, <laughs> it's, 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 i know uh, jason ritter jamie king and the writer director who is also the star of the film marina polka right yeah. this is this is this is the plot of this movie right this, this little family marina polka is playing the mother and she has these kids they're completely unruly she's married to jason ritter he's this guy who's Fairly, fairly inept, but trying to do the right thing. And he's really good in this movie. He's funny, but it's all kind of tragic. There's this dog that's barking. And what happens is 
the mom has this psychic break where she deeply and truly believes becomes a vicious rabbit dog. And and, and 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 she and she is and it's it's really really interesting and there's a lot of sort of deep psychological commentary going on in this movie yet it's still funny as heck uh, so I like it a lot for that reason alone so you know this is one of those neat little uh, indies that if you're just not paying attention you you, you would mi miss uh, but nowadays you can pick up watch it on a stream in a streaming situation or something like that it's a really neat little movie. I got two over here, which I like to put together because it looks like they're facing off. <laughs> All those covers, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that it's great? Big kill, yeah, yeah. All right. So I'm Shotguns. Gonna, I'm going to explain what, what, uh, what Tim's laughing at. So 68 Kill is Blu-ray and DVD combo set, and uh, it's got uh, Annalyn McCord holding a shotgun pointing to the right. And then I've got Bad Day for the Cut. With um, I forget which actor this is, uh, but he's holding Chris, double. Uh, What's that guy? Is that, that Niall, whatever his name? Yeah, is. Niall O'Neill or something. He's like that. he's holding a shotgun pointing the other direction. Lynch is in that film. So if you put these two together, it looks like they're holding shotguns on each other. <laughs> it's I always, fantastic. It's, I always enjoy getting getting you know covers that that uh, that match <laughs> that way. Um, anyway, sixty eight kill is uh, is is just a it's a you know a, a, a vengeful woman uh, shoot him up cult film it's designed to be a throwback to all that um, all that kind of uh, well, you know, you feminist th late 60s early 70s I spit on your graves kind of stuff um, you know yeah it's 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 not much at all uh, it, but it's it's got a lot of fun action and it's culty and it's it's tongue in cheek and it's having fun with it written what, and directed by Trent Haga what people will do for sixty eight thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean it's. Listen yeah. to me, I'm talking crap. Like, like, like I wouldn't kill three or four people for sixty eight thousand dollars. Yeah, insane. and then Bad Day for the Cut was uh, was a film that that got a little bit of attention at Sundance last year. I like that movie. Why did it not catch fire? Ah, you, you most it, actually mo Sundance is uh, you know uh, it's going on right now. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, and I was listening to some numbers about it. it. The numbers for Sundance are getting really bad, dude. I know they are. The, the you know, in term by the numbers, I mean uh, the number of films that a get picked up at all. Yeah. B of the ones that get picked up to get any kind of significant distribution. Now we're down yeah. to about five or six films. And the and amount B, of money they make. The amount of money they make yeah. juxtaposed to how much money people they've been yeah. overspending at Sundance. I'm sorry, I went off on a crazy ass yeah. tangent, but they've been overspending at Sundance. Yep. I didn't think I'd ever say that, but they have. True. Yeah. It's very true. Well, anyway, it's a thriller, super violent, super bloody. Uh, and it's a you know it's got a guy he's, his mother's murdered and he goes out for vengeance to track down you know the the killers in in, in Belfast Ireland, um, and uh, it, it it gets into that whole existential journey thing uh, that you know you're you're out for vengeance but what are you really out for well it's a journey of self discovery and there's some pretty dark Irish humor in this as well but um, yeah I just I wish this had um, I wish this had kind of caught on a little bit but it, it didn't it's so a really anyway. good performance I liked it a lot yeah so that's Bad Day for the Cut so you know Bad Day for the Cut good film to discover 68 Kill it's uh, it's trashy and, and fun and doesn't make a lot of sense but it's nice to pass the time in the same world of 68 Kill I've got MFA and this, this is clever what they're doing here MFA Masters yeah. of Fine Arts because yeah. the uh, Francesca Eastwood uh, one of Clint Eastwood's uh, younger daughters is yes. the lead in this uh, and with I think Francis uh, the, the redhead here. I, I, anyway, whatever. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, so MFA also the title of this film, mastering the art of revenge. So it's about this young art student that Eastwood is playing, uh, who is raped. Uh, and she manages to find and slaughter fa fairly viciously her rapist. Uh, and in the process of doing that, creating some fairly interesting sort of Jackson uh, uh, Pollocky sort of uh, art, <laughs> you know, you, if you think if you think about the, that there, uh, and it becomes fairly uh, famous from that, and realizes that uh, she can just keep killing dudes and making nice paintings. There we go. Uh, and it, so you know, it's one of again, you know, I spin on your grave, all sure. that kind of stuff. What is cool about it is Francesca. Uh, Frances <laughs> Francesca Eastwood here is really kicking some ass. I've been watching her for a couple of years. Cliff. Uh, 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 um, uh, what's his name? Clif uh, Clifton uh, Cla Curtin. Clavin. Cl Clavin on Cheers. <laughs> that's that's it. Say uh, is also in this film. Yeah. So it's a neat little movie, neat little revenge film. In 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 a time when you know movies like this are probably apropos. You know, uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer from Yorgos Lanthimos, the director of The Lobster, reunify yeah. he reunites with uh, Colin Farrell, 
and uh, and Nicole Kidman's in this as well. Uh, this didn't really catch fire like the lobster did. We we the lobster got a lot of attention, even though I think it's overrated. This whole people turning into animals thing was just weird. I like that one. Didn't like this one. You know, um, yeah. What, what and I've I've been one of those people who was down on Lanthimos kind of from the beginning. I, I think he's just really pretentious and a little bit overrated, and he he tries too hard to just to be weird for, for weird sake. And um, I kind of still feel the same way. Uh, I, I like Colin Farrell in this. I like that he's, you know, stretching and he's trying to play, you know, more character parts and diminish his looks and buries himself in that beard and yeah. the whole thing. Um, but it still, it still feels just too weird. Uh, you know, he and Nicole Kidman are a couple and they've got a couple of kids, 12-year-old to 14-year-old. He's a heart surgeon. Uh, and uh, then there's this the, this character played by uh, Barry uh, Keehan. Is that how you pronounce his yeah. name? Yeah. Keehan? Uh, this character played by Barry T- Barry Keehan, uh, who is um, who insinuates himself into the family, and uh, the story deals with what the the aftermath of that. I won't get into giving anything away, but there's a there's a, there's stuff that happens, and it takes you to typically weird and dark place. Um, I don't. Uh, why does this film not work? <laughs> I don't. You know, it, for one thing. After having seen the lobster, which I admit I did, yeah. I did enjoy and think that there was something interesting going on in in that film thematically. Yeah, uh, that's all revealed in this film. I'm, I, you know, you know what I mean. This, yeah. I'm, I'm like now I'm on to you. Uh, I'm, um, uh, See, that's your what ghost. I'm on to you now. Yeah, and once I'm on to you, I'm on to you. You got to do a different thing. Uh, and uh, but you know you're just you know you have just so no that doesn't that one doesn't work for me. He, for some re- for some reason there I I feel like there's a generation of directors who who misunderstood what Bergman and all those guys in the '60s were doing. Mm. They thought that they were that they were making, and this is maybe the best way to put this. All those directors in the 60s that just kind of exploded at that time, and everybody from Kurosawa to Bergman to Antonioni to, you know, the New Wave directors to to Bunuel, these guys were not going out there saying, I am going to tell people how to live. I'm going to tell them what's wrong with their lives. They were wrestling with their own lives yeah. and their own issues. And these movies are very, very personal. And I feel like Lanthimos and a lot of his generation don't get that. Mm. They they sort of are consumed. They're, they're a little preoccupied with their own ideas, and they think I've got all the answers. And and it's that answer question thing again, right? Mm-hmm. Like with faith based films, if you're a director and you think you have all the answers, and that's why you're making a movie is to tell me the answers. I don't want to see that movie. Yeah. No, no, no. But if you are asking questions and you're making your movie to wrestle with these questions, and you're just asking questions, and the movie is part of your process. I can become part of that, and I can connect to that. And uh, you particularly know, particularly if they live in a sort of real world, anyway. Yeah. Ozu was another one, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, all right, so a couple of a couple of <laughs> real world. We're into cult movies now. <laughs> just, just Franco, just Franco here. Oh my God, I love these movies. Two female spies <laughs> with flowered panties, which is just you know. Look, if if there was nothing but the title of the movie, I'd be okay. Uh, but this is a, this is an absolutely fantastic oh, sort of yes. um, the '70s sort of thriller. It's it's, it's about these uh, uh, these women who get out of prison and they go to work for the U.S. government uh, 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 to, to find out uh, about. It's just all what you end up with is a bunch of threesomes. Yeah, uh, a bunch of kinky <laughs> threesomes that happen the whole for point. no reason whatsoever. This is fantastic. Yeah. All kinds of uh, wonderful special features here. Uh, including the composer of the film uh, and uh, uh, Stephen Thrower and uh, just all kinds of stuff. Um, the other one also just um, Killer Barbies, which folks might remember Killer Barbies, which was actually uh, a pretty big hit at the time, relatively speaking. Um, in the genre of films where you have a you know a whole bunch of teenagers and they go off to off into the woods and this yeah. case off to a castle up on the top of a hill someplace and there's this sort of nutty uh, 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 sort of vampire sort of per- person up and, and they and she's killing these young people and, and, and drinking their blood and he, so that she can maintain her youth. Uh, and, and what you end up with is just you know all of these girls sort of roaming around this castle in panties and t-shirts, <laughs> and I'm like I don't know what the hell's going on in this movie, but this is fantastic. When I, it, was, it, was, it was great at the time. Uh, thank God. Just Franco, by the way, Vampiros Lesbos, I think, would be the yeah. big sort of Just Franco film that a lot of people would know. Uh, this is pretty neat, too, in terms of special features. Uh, and these are all remastered, which I think is the most interesting thing about them. They're all remastered. This one has an English language soundtrack and a French soundtrack, as well as an audio commentary by historian Troy 
Whole wall. Uh, even worse is The Devil's Honey, which is a Lucio Fulci film. This is from Severin. Um, this is just gloriously bad. Uh, look, there, there's no for, forget about the plot here. There's no there's no plot. <laughs> it really isn't. This is just Lucio Fulci. Of course, was a, a, a giallo uh, yeah. guy, right? It's all kind of gore and whatnot. And that he, he was he's the godfather of all the rest of them in many respects. Uh, and um, this thing is just it's just self-consciously filthy and horrible um you've got uh, look let me let me just read let me just read from because i can't i could never describe this as well as they do uh brett halsey and blanca marcelot star in this insane snm saga complete with sodomy torture torrid romance rampant nudity and a jaw-dropping cavalcade of kink uh, you, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's called the Devil's Honey. <laughs> I, I, there's no better way to describe this. That's exactly what it is. It That's is a good. jaw-dropping cavalcade of kink. Uh, we also have the Fox with a Velvet Tail from Mondo Macabro. Uh, this is a Spanish Italian film from 1971. Uh, I probably found this. This is Giallo film, and it's you know a bit of a murder mystery, and it takes place in southern France, but it's still a Giallo film, and it's still a little nasty and trashy, and you know whatnot uh sexy and sexy and gory uh and uh it's sort of like if hitchcock were were untalented and uh didn't have a script but he had a lot of people who are willing to you know do gore and sex then this is this would be the movie the fox with a velvet tail if that even makes sense Mm. anyway looks really surprisingly good to be honest they did a 4k transfer from the negative and for a for a kind of an exploitation movie a euro a euro trash exploitation movie from 1971 that's a lot of work, and uh, I'm sure the negative didn't look good, but, man, they made it look great. So it's got all those garish colors from the era, and uh, it, it's it's kind of a nice, trashy throwback. So there's a lot of fun to watching it, even though it's not very good. The Fox with a Velvet Tail. There is a bit of wackiness that is also sort of insightful in this perfectly insane trauma film. Trauma's yeah. been around forever. Yeah. Uh, I remember interviewing those guys maybe 30 years ago or something like that. Anyway, this is called Lloyd, you know, Lloyd Kaufman is where uh, the thingy confessions of a teenage placenta. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and 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 here's and, and here's the wacky and, 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 and yeah, Lloyd. placenta. So you're know, like this blob. It's it's this blob of placenta with a face and eyes and a mouth, and it can sort of jungulate. Yeah. And, and it's and what I love about it is that the physical thing in the film is a practical effect. Yeah. Uh, they would do that CGI mostly now, but it's a practical effect. It's just a blob or something. Some dude is under there. You know yeah. some dude is under there. This is the neat thing about it, though, right? So the idea is that this woman has a baby. The baby is stillborn, but her afterbirth, the placenta, is imbued for some reason we do not know with life. She raises it. She raises it to be a teenager. A very sophisticated, intelligent, faithful uh, a teenager with face. He's, 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 he's like a kid who... Yet all of her friends are these drunks and junkies and alcoholics, yet her placenta, her live teenage son placenta, oh, is, is, is trying to talk all of these guys into, into being better people. That's a little bit nutty in a certain sort of way uh, and uh, an idea. Let's just call it an idea. Nevertheless, uh, should you go and see it? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Maybe not. Probably not. So uh, here's one that's a little bit more recent. This is a Marco Ferreri film called The Flesh from 1991. That's relatively recent. Now, Marco Ferreri is a legit director. I mean, he's a legit uh, Italian director who's made some very, very fine films. Uh, this is not one of them. This is, this is a little bit trashy. This is from Cult Epics, who only does really, really fun, trashy stuff. And uh, it stars the very legit Sergio Castillito, who is a great actor and a great director now. Uh, has, has more or less become so since 1991. Um, and it also stars uh, a, an actress whose name you probably know more infamously, Francesca Dallara, who previously made a lot of Tinto Brass movies like uh, Capriccio, and, you know, who's kind of a, a softcore queen. The idea here really splits the difference. It's, it wants to be a legit film, but it's basically about a woman who uh, has sort of sex powers and who hypnotizes him into being her sex slave and then decides she's done with him, throws him away, but he's not ready to go so easily. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is a Blu-ray DVD combo set. Uh, it, it, it's it's fun and, and silly and very, very Euro. It feels like it belongs to an earlier era than 1991, but in point of fact, it does not. Marco Ferreri... Um, 
Made it in 1991. And then we also have uh, All the Sins of Sodom and Vibration on the Joseph W. Sarno Retrospect series. Uh, this is a Blu-ray from Film Movement Classics. Uh, it, you know, this splits the difference between cult and, and art, uh, which is what Sarno did. Um, Joseph Sarno is a really, really interesting figure and uh, pro- you know, primarily known as Joe Sarno. Yeah. He's interviewed here. And uh, then there's a, a uh, which is quite interesting, and there's a commentary as well by a um, uh, film historian and Peggy Stefan Sarno. Um, the, I used to love all those movies from back then. Him, Henry Paris. Yeah. Uh, they, they're all late 60s. Yeah. And they, what's interesting is, and we could probably put, um, we could probably put uh, Ron, uh, Russ Meyer in there too. Russ Meyer, yeah. Russ Meyer would go in there as well. At least his early stuff, not the later stuff, yeah. like you know, but but things like Mud Honey, yeah, definitely belong to this kind of class where people are making what are essentially sex exploitation films, uh, but yet they're making them with a sort of an artistic intent and with artistic technique, yeah, and it elevates them and it makes them relevant in a really weird artifactual way. All these Sometimes decades when later, the actors were pretty good. You would get some inter- Henry Paris, also known as Radley Mesker, yeah. Which one was the stage name? Uh, uh, Paris, yeah, Paris was Paris the stage, was stage name. name. But yeah. sometimes when the actors, when the acting was good, and then of course you know you'd have all this sort of kinky sexual dynamics going on, but yeah. they could be interesting. Uh, so anyway, all the sins of Sodom and uh, vibrations. Vibrations is particularly interesting. You know, it uh, it gets into fe- female repression, and uh, obviously the sub the vibrations is not just you know in the Beach Boys good vibration sense, but there's actually you know a vibrator that has a very uh, substantial role to play in the story. Uh, so anyway, uh, Sarno is a really interesting figure, and uh, I, I, I applaud Film Movement for releasing his stuff on Blu-ray as part of the Film Movement Classics. So we are going to p- continue to get Joseph Sarno releases. Uh, this is only the first in the in the Joseph W. Sarno retrospect series. So more will come. Film Movement has plenty to uh, plenty to release on the uh, on the Sarno line. Mm, interesting uh, stuff there. Uh, Want to pop over to a little yeah, TV? Let's do some TV. Uh, SWAT, the, the 1975 SWAT, the complete series. People forget that Robert Urich, you know, Steve Forrest was the lead of the SWAT team, but people forget that Robert Urich was in the series before Dan Tanner, before Vegas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you got Robert Urich here. And I just think that it was really neat. This was one of the early ones that I really liked a lot. I love this series. It was set here. It was set here in LA. Yeah. Uh, so back in back in the middle seventies, how did this play for you guys? For you actual LA guys, you know, uh, it was uh, I was really into a lot of these shows at the time. This was kind of not my favorite one. Uh, it it was like a better version of Adam Twelve. Yeah, I was going to say and, you had your and one Adam Twelves and yet your emergency, yeah. Because every episode was kind of another crisis, yeah. right? It's like okay, like the thing with Adam Twelve is every episode they're going on regular calls. Every episode of Emergency was an emergency. Every episode of SWAT was SWAT team's got to go do it. You know, we got a hostage situation. We got whatever it is. Um, as opposed to something like The Rookies. Yeah. Right? Where the intimate lives of these characters were very different week in and week out. And and it was much more about the characters and not some not kind of always about the situation. crime moment. What not always the about moment. the crime moment. Yeah. It, it, it's the SWAT. And, 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 of course, right now. Well, there was that movie in in the middle two thousands. Yeah, the Colin Farrell, Sam Jackson, Colin Farrell. Yeah. We just talked about him. Yeah. And right now, there, uh, there. This is on television again. Yeah, this is a, a series again. There it so, is. So these uh, forty years hence. Yeah, and it's come back around. Yeah. Man, intellectual properties are a hell of a thing. Uh, they are. <laughs> they are. They never stop paying. No. Anyway, this is neat. This is the complete series. Some great old faces in here, uh, including the team, uh, the SWAT team. But the really great old faces are all the people who pop up in every episode of these things. Who you're going to be like Ed Asner? Yep. <laughs> you're going to oh, you all these all of these folks. I have so much fun with that kind of stuff in in these series. Uh, and we have the complete second season of Rowan and Martin's Laugh In. Uh, which is something that has just never stopped fascinating me. I watch these all the time. They actually air on broadcast television, uh, uh, you're probably all over the country, but certainly here in L.A. on one yep. of those little channels there. And again, you have this sort of really interesting time capsule of that period. This is the second season, so we're still, we're still in the 60s. We're still in the, uh, late, the middle to late 60s. Yep. And the references and the people who pop up, uh, people forget that Richard Nixon was on Rowan Martin's, you know, that, you know, Socket to Me? Yeah. That was Richard, uh, Ed Sullivan was on this show. 
uh, Mel Brooks and Johnny Carson and Sammy Davis Jr. and Phil and Kurt Douglas and then uh, Bob. D it's just all sorts of really interesting. It's a time capsule of all of that. But what fascinates me are those little segues. When uh, when 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 Rowan and Martin are standing yeah. and they're and, they, and those little conversations they have, dude, Such so sharp show. so sharp, so yeah. sharp. Uh, this show and funny. Uh, anyway, twenty six episodes of season two. Here comes the judge, uh, including some bonus features. Laugh in, uh, watchable, forever watchable. So far as I'm concerned. A Town Called Panic, The Collection. A Town Called Panic is a, uh, a stop motion, a very weird kind of a stop motion. It started as a movie in 2009 uh, and was screened at Cannes. And uh, it, it's, uh, it became a, um, a series. And it's a weird stop motion-y kind of uh, – what's, what's the, uh, the Seth Green show that I always forget the title of, the stop motion thing on TV that he does? Uh, oh, uh, 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 oh, I do know the thing that you're yeah. talking about. Oh, for yeah. Christ's sake. That stop motion that. thing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, robot uh, – what's it? Uh, robot monkey. monkey robot, robot chicken? chicken? Robot chicken. Robot thank chicken. You. That's, that's it. it is, yeah. Robot monkey. <laughs> I'm getting senile. So, uh, robot chicken. Yeah, it's 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 a little bit like that, except French style, uh, with an Indian and a cowboy, and all and all the rest of their very strange, deranged Toy Story type uh, uh, acolytes. Um, you know, there. What's cute on here is Christmas Panic. That's actually a very very cute story, but. Um, uh, the the rest of the thing is a little bit uneven. I guess you have to have a really tweaked sense of humor to sort of get into this. It is, uh, it is a, again, like Robot Chicken meets Toy Story with a little bit of a French spin. But um, it's out on Blu-ray from uh, Shout Factory, courtesy of G-Kids, who does all the animation stuff. A Town Called Panic, The Collection, 20 episodes, including Christmas Panic and Back to School Panic. And then we also have uh, Teen Titans, the complete first season. As everyone knows, I'm not a huge fan of the, uh, you know, the... Like, yeah, the teenage like superheroes. The, the teenage superheroes and baby Muppets and, uh, you know, the Looney Tunes kids and, you know, like, let's make them younger and we'll be we'll be all cute about it. I, I'm not really into that. Uh, I'd rather see them as adults, fully powerful. Anyway, 13 episodes of Teen Titans, complete first season on Blu-ray. Uh, it, it is, it is, I guess, modestly satisfying if you're, uh, if you're enjoying the whole DC thing, but, uh, I, 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 I'm a little bit over it. Yeah. Um, the complete second season of Victoria, which I'm thoroughly enjoying. For one thing, I have a crush a on great, Jenna Coleman. Right. That notwithstanding, because I'm a Doctor Who guy. I love The Crown. Yeah. But as a compliment to The Crown. Yes. Considering that this is Queen Elizabeth's great-grandmother. Grandmother, yeah. It's important. Yes, yes. These things go together in a very it, particular uh, way. And what I like about both of the series, despite the fact that they're yeah. set when they're set, is that they are they they are so connected yeah. to contemporary society. So it's like you watch these series, and and it's like a through line. You yes. can look back through these series and understand exactly what the hell is going on today. Yeah. I I watch these series, and I know why Brexit happened. If you watch these two series, oh totally, if these two series explain why Brexit of was course. inevitable. <laughs> Brexit was inevitable. If you watch these two yeah. series, it's, it has to do with that. But anyway, this is pretty good. A lot of bonus features on here, too, including over 25 minutes of bonus video. Uh, S'more Entertainment, who used to release a lot of stuff but doesn't do a whole lot anymore, uh, has uh, comes out with some interesting stuff every once in a while. They still have some some goods in their, in their library or in their locker. And one of them is this uh, television production of Camelot. Uh, with Richard Harris, who of course was in the movie Camelot, but um, this is uh, this is the Learner and Low Camelot, and uh, it's part of the, what was staged is HBO Theater for videotape in 1980, and uh, so you you get a little bit different take. Uh, you know, Richard Harris played in the in the movie. It was 60, what is it, 68? Oh, yeah. Something like that. It's yeah. late 60s. So uh, Camelot the movie is, you know, uh, more than a decade, decade and a half prior to this. So he's he's changed it up a little bit, and um, it's not the same as the movie. In some respects, it's better, but still, it's, it's you know, Lerner and Lowe's Camelot done for television for as an early HBO production in the very early days of HBO in 1980. And uh, I, I, I thought it was – I think it's really great. The songs are still terrific, and the cast is interesting. Meg Bussert, Richard Munns. Uh, I, I, I just don't think you can go wrong with Camelot. 
really one of the all-time yeah. great musicals. Yeah, 67. I just go 67, there it is. Right there. Yeah. Ray Donovan, are you a Ray Donovan guy? I just never, Gosh, I the never first, could. The first season uh, was interesting, and it was promising. Yeah. And I thought, this is going to go into some interesting places. And then the second season just seemed to kind of stall out a little bit. It became obvious, uh, you know, Ray Donovan, this guy yeah. who goes around, you know, fixer for the Hollywood. But, you know, it's family and all that kind of stuff. But I, but it, I don't feel like they've, they've yeah. taken it further, right? It, 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 it brought it to a certain place in that first season, and there, there are some high stakes. And then it's just sort of more it, – it becomes like a, like a grittier Rockford Files yeah. without the jokes. Exactly, except that the, the Jim Rockford yeah. was a good guy. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Ray is a dubious guy yes, in the first is. place. You yes. know, and and and, and that's I, what I mean without the jokes. Yeah, it's not, I, he's not funny. Yeah, I have a hard time hanging my hat on him as my hero. Yeah, uh, it's you know, but Jim Rockford, you know, he'll take it in the in the. But you can for make you. me yeah. interested. You can make me interested in him, invested in him. If you take him further, if you push him into moral dilemmas, if you force him into situations which they're not forcing him into, I I kind of want them to. And they still have a chance to do it. I bet it's been yeah. on for five years. Yeah, this is well. This is season five. They're obviously five. not gonna not gonna take any further chances with yeah. it. A few a few special features. It's an interesting thing. If you're into it, you want to want to pick it up. But that's, yeah, that just all sure. depends. There you go. Yeah. Uh, we got a few from uh, Acorn, and I'll uh, we're losing we're quick at the end of the show. So let me let me pound through these uh, fairly quickly. Uh, Doc Martin series eight. Still a great show. This is on Blu-ray from Acorn TV. Doc Martin has been a great show from day one. Series uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you've seen any of them, they're fantastic. They're all great. Uh, Martin Clunes is just a terrific actor. Should be in features, but you know his bread and butter is British television, and good for him. He's he's just he's he's killed it. So Doc Martin uh, on Blu-ray, uh, series eight, uh, Midsummer Murders, uh, John Barnaby's. First Cases box set, which is uh, quite good. Uh, Midsummer Murders is just one of the all-time great mystery shows on on British television, and this has uh, about 12 mysteries on it. 15, actually. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 mysteries. Uh, it'll take you forever to watch them. This is, the, you know, like 20-some, tw- 21 hours worth of mysteries. It'll, it'll go on forever. So you can, you, you know, and they're all good. They're all great. So uh, a lot of great guest stars, too. Then we also have Rake, um, which stars the uh, absolutely terrific Richard Roxburgh. This, is a, this all takes place in the court system in Australia. This is absolutely terrific. Uh, Richard Roxburgh, great actor. Keeps getting better. Uh, and uh, then lastly, we have one that I had not seen before, which is Acceptable Risk, which is an Acorn TV original. And Acceptable Risk uh, stars Elaine Cassidy, who is who was previously in The Paradise. A little bit Aaron Brockovichy here, uh, Irish character, uh, takes place uh, primarily in uh, Montreal. Um, really uh, quite interesting, uh, the kind of international thriller intrigue thing. It's called Acceptable Risk. And um, see it just for the great performance by Elaine Cassidy. She's absolutely terrific. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll knock this one off real, really yep. quick. The the complete the complete series Girlfriends. When this series first aired back in 2000, first of all, it blows me away that this series first aired back in 2000. Crazy, it makes me right? dizzy. Right. Uh, Tracy Ross Ellis, who of course we know from uh, Blackish now. This is a series about these four young black women. Uh, living lo- the lives that they were living, uh, y- y- having a fabulous time, dating and doing this and doing that, and ha- it's just this wonderful thing, which we hadn't seen on television before. No. You know, a lot of people forget about that. That, yeah. was a, that was a big-ass deal. It was. Sexy and smart and funny and all of that. The thing that I love about the series, which was created by Maria Brock Akil, is that the executive producer, Kelsey Grammer. Yeah. Kelsey Grammer. <laughs> yeah. They came to Kelsey Grammer and said, hey, Kelsey, we got this series about these four black chicks. They're funny. Kelsey's yeah. like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. Anyway, it was a, it's a wonderful series that made a big difference in the lives of a lot of young black women yeah. over the course of that period. A lot of young black women grew up watching this series, reshaping what it meant to be. A, in the same way that, uh, what was the one, Sex in the City? Sure. In the, the sure. exact same, the same way that Sex in the City did. You know, that. Kelsey Girlfriend. Grammer, I'll say this right before we close out the show, Kelsey Grammer is a real pay it forward kind of guy. Yeah. Because he paid so many dues for so long, really fought so hard, took so much abuse for so long before he finally cracked through. He knows what it takes. And when people, you know, came to him saying, you know, help me realize my dreams, he was ready to do it. Here's my Kelsey Grammer story. Uh, people, people do not open car doors for strangers. Kelsey Grammer does. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we were we were out in the middle of nowhere. I'm assuming, you know, 
his offices are probably somewhere there, and uh, picking up food at Chipotle. Came came out of Chipotle, and Kelsey Grammer, they, he and some guy had just parked right next to us, and he literally opened the door for my wife, the passenger side door for my wife. I thought, that is such an unbelievably class act. Normally a star would be like, oh, here, <laughs> sunglasses, put that hat down, don't see me. I just thought that's amazing. Mm-hmm. This is a real class act. So I have a lot of I have a lot of love and respect for Kelsey. Gentlemen Kelly. on the scholar. Anyway, that's all right. It for that's me. it. Done for the show. We'll see you guys next week.